Part 1. We'll hear two students, Jacinta and Lewis, discussing a holiday they are planning in Queenstown, a tourist center in New Zealand popular with young people. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hi, Lewis. It's Jacinta here. Oh, hi, Jacinta. I was just going to call you. I was thinking we ought to do something about accommodation for our trip to Queenstown. Yeah, actually, that's just why I rang you. I've been looking on the internet. There was one place that looked OK called Traveller's Lodge. But when I checked availability for January, when we're planning to go, I found it was fully booked. Right. Well, we'd better do something now, I suppose. I've actually got a list up here on the computer. There's one place called Bingley's that looks possible. It's $19.75 a night. That's US dollars. They quote all the prices in US dollars. So that's about 26 or 27 New Zealand dollars. That's OK. That'll be in a dormitory, is it? Yeah, they say eight-bed dorms. And the hostel's right in the town centre. And they've got a cafe. They have theme nights every weekend, whatever that means. Oh, you know, like certain sorts of food and music. And people might wear special clothes, like that Egyptian evening we went to last year. Oh, OK. What else? They've got a sun deck area, and then all the usual things, internet access and so on. Sounds good. Was there anywhere else? Yeah, a couple more places. There's one called Chalet Lodge, which is just 18 US dollars. That's for a bed in a 12-bed dorm. They do single and family rooms as well. It looks as if it's a bit out of town, says it's got an alpine setting, a quiet alpine setting. What do you think? Not sure. Oh, but actually it's not far out at all. It says 10 minutes walk from town, so... Oh, and it says it's children-friendly. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. What about the third place? Uh, that's called Globetrotters. Let's see. They do private rooms or five-bed dorms for 1850 It's in the centre, just by the lake, and that includes breakfast. Didn't the other two? I don't think so. They didn't mention it, so probably not. Oh, and it says something about a free skydive. Wow. Don't know if I'm all that keen on jumping out of aeroplanes. Oh, actually, what it says is you can win a chance to do a skydive. They give one away every day to one of the guests. Well, if I win it, you can do it. Anyway, do they have room? Yeah, I checked the availability. Shall I go ahead and book there then? Fine. You now have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I was looking at what there is to do too. There are lots of sites offering deals for adventure sports. <laughs> I suppose we have to do a bungee jump. Why? Well, it's Queenstown where they more or less started it as a sport. You can. 
if you really want to jump off the side of a bridge with an elastic rope tied round your ankles. I'll watch. OK, so what do you want to do? As far as adventure sports go, I was talking to someone who went whitewater rafting there. He said it was really awesome. They drive you up the Shotover River and then you come down on a rubber raft through the whitewater rapids where the river's really narrow and fast and end up going through a tunnel nearly 200 metres long. I think it's quite expensive, though. Oh, I'm on for that if you are. Cool. The other thing you can do is the jet boat ride. That sounded just a lot of noise, though. It's basically just whizzing round on the river on a very fast boat, isn't it? My friend did that as well. He said it was a bit touristy, but worth it. I'll give it a go. You go right up the river canyon. He said the drivers were really skillful. But I don't mind going on my own. But there's lots to do as well as the whole commercial adventure bit. We ought to do some trekking. The scenery around there's amazing. I don't want to miss that. The place to start's Glenorchy, apparently, about 40 minutes' drive. That's where lots of the wilderness trails begin. OK. I'll pack my walking boots. I'd better start getting in training. I haven't done anything except sit at my desk for months. Now, is there anything else we need to decide? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two students discussing a project on international festivals with their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning. Shall we start by looking at the topic of your project? So, what have you decided to research? Well, we thought we'd compare festivals in different countries and see if any of them are similar. Yeah, you know, like the carnival celebrations in South America and the water festival in Thailand. OK. What exactly are you planning to study? The origins of the festivals? The types of celebration? People's attitudes towards the festivals? We were planning to look at the origins of the festivals and the time of year they're celebrated. We're thinking of looking at the connection between the seasons in different countries and the actual festivals, and then looking for similarities between countries that are quite far apart. Well, that sounds interesting. Did you say you've already started researching into the carnival? Yes. We've already found a connection between the carnival and the seasons. For instance, some researchers say that a very long time ago in Europe, people used to put on colourful masks and costumes at the beginning of the year to celebrate the end of winter, and then they could get ready for spring. Right. And then what happened? Well, as the years went by, the purpose of the carnival changed and it became a religious festival. These days, there are big carnival celebrations in countries all across the world, like Brazil and India and Indonesia. But an interesting thing we discovered is that in some countries, people celebrate the carnival by throwing water at each other in the street. Well, we thought that, obviously, this is because carnivals celebrated at the hottest time of the year, just before the rainy season. So, splashing people with water is a very good way of cooling them down. 
before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Hmm, yes, that makes sense. Um, did you look into any other festivals? Yes, we did. What we're planning to do is more research into water festivals. We found that in Asian countries, where there aren't any carnival celebrations, there are still festivals that involve people splashing each other with water. Actually, we found references to them in Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, China and Japan. But we also found a reference to a water festival in Mexico. So we thought we'd look into that a bit more and see if we can find any similarities between these countries. Uh, I mean... We realise that water is more than just a way of cooling people down in hot weather. It also has a lot of different religious meanings and purposes. For instance, we found that in some societies, water can mean life or wealth or just luck. Yes, and another thing we found out is that these water festivals often celebrate the beginning of the new year, just like the original celebrations hundreds of years ago before the carnival. So... Um, up to now, we found that the carnival and the seasons are linked by ancient traditions and that water plays an important part in the celebrations. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. A tutorial between two students and their tutor. The students are doing a research project on computer use. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Dr. Barrett? Sammy, come in. Is Irene with you? Yes. Good. Sit down. Right. We're looking at how far you've got with your research project since we last met. Uh, you decided to do a survey about computer facilities at the university, didn't you? That's right. We decided to investigate the university's open access to a computer when they need one, so we thought it would be a useful area to research. Good. It's not a topic anyone has looked at before, as far as I know, uh, so it's a good choice. So what background reading did you do? Well, we looked in the catalogs in the library, but we couldn't find much that was useful. It's such a specialized subject. Hardly anything seems to have been published about it. And as well as that, the technology is all changing so quickly. But the Open Access Center has an online questionnaire on computer use that it asks all the students to do at the end of their first year, and the supervisor gives us access to that data. So we used it as a starting point for our research. It wasn't exactly what we needed. 
but it gave us an idea of what we wanted to find out in our survey. Then we designed our own questionnaire. And how did you use it? We approached students individually and went through our questionnaire with them on a one-to-one -one basis. So you actually asked them the questions? That's right. We made notes of the answers as we went along, and actually we found we got a bit of extra information that way as well. About the underlying attitudes of the people we were interviewing, by observing the body language and things like that. How big was your sample? Well, altogether, we interviewed a random sample of 65 students, 55% male and 45% female. And what about the locations and times of the survey? We went to the five open access computer centers at the university, and we got about equal amounts of data at each one. It took us three weeks. We did it during the week, in the day and in the evenings. Not the weekends? No. So, presumably, your respondents were mostly full-time students. Yes. Oh, you mean we should have collected some data at the weekends from the part-time students? We didn't think of that. Okay. It's just an example of how difficult it is to get a truly random sample. So, how far have you got with the analysis of results? Well, everyone agrees there was a problem, but we're more interested in what they think should be done about it. The most popular suggestion was for some sort of booking system. About 77% of the students thought that would be best. But there were other suggestions. For example, about 65% of people thought it would help if the opening hours were longer, like 24 hours a day. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The Atlantic Ocean, named for the legendary lost island of Atlantis, has made up for the romantic origin of its name by becoming the most important commercial highway in the world, yet traces of romance continually mingle with the business of the sea. For instance, the Spanish adventurers who first sought gold and silver in America frequently found their ships becalmed, usually on the edge of the steady trade winds, about 30 degrees north or south latitude. A sailing ship could carry only so much water, and as it lay motionless under a hot sun for days or weeks, the tortures of thirst were agonizing. The horses were generally the first victims. They had to be thrown overboard when they died, or became crazed with thirst. Because the Spanish caballeros thought highly of their horses, even crediting them with souls, they suffered great remorse and believed the ghosts of the proud war horses were haunting the scene. They saw the restless spirits in their dreams and related their dreams to sailors. Whenever the mariners passed that way, they would see in the spray or clouds images of wild horses bearing down on them. They began to call the broad belts of calm the horse latitudes, the romantic name by which they are known today. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. 
Part Four. You will hear a lecture giving advice on how to present a seminar paper. First, read questions thirty-one to forty. Complete the notes of the outline. Write no more than three words in each answer. In this talk, I am going to give some advice on how to present a seminar paper. At one time, most university teaching took the form of giving formal lectures. Nowadays, many university teachers try to involve their students more actively in the learning process. One of the ways in which this is done is by conducting seminars. In a seminar, what usually happens is this: one student is chosen to give his ideas on a certain topic. These ideas are then discussed by the other students, the participants in the seminar. What I'd like to discuss with you today is the techniques of presenting a paper at a seminar. As you know, there are two main stages involved in this. One is the preparation stage, which involves researching and writing up a topic. The other stage is the presentation stage, when you actually present the paper to your audience. It is this second stage that I am now concerned with. Let us therefore imagine that you have been asked to lead off a seminar discussion, and that you have done all the necessary preparation. In other words, you have done the research and you have written it up. How are you going to present it? There are two ways in which this can be done. The first method is to circulate copies of the paper in advance to all the participants. This gives them time to read it before the seminar, so that they can come already prepared with their own ideas about what you have written. The second method is where there is no time for previous circulation, or there is some other reason why the paper cannot be circulated. In that case, of course, the paper will have to be read aloud to the group, who will probably make their own notes on it while they are listening. In this talk, I am going to concentrate on the first method. Where the paper is circulated in advance, as this is a most efficient way of conducting a seminar. But most of what I am going to say also applies to the second method, and indeed may be useful to remember any time you have to speak in public. You will probably be expected to introduce your paper, even if it has been circulated beforehand. There are two good reasons for this. One. Is that the participants may have read the paper but forgotten some of the main points. The second reason is that some of the participants may not, in fact, have had time to read your paper, although they may have glanced through it quickly. They will therefore not be in a position to comment on it unless they get some idea of what it is all about. When you are introducing your paper, what you must not do is simply read the whole paper aloud. This is because, firstly, if the paper is a fairly long one, there may not be enough time for discussion. From your point of view, the discussion is the most important thing. It is very helpful for you if other people criticize your work. In that way, you can improve it. Secondly, a lot of information can be understood when one is reading. It is not so easy to pick up detailed information when one is listening. In other words, there may be a lack of comprehension or understanding. Thirdly, it can be very boring listening to something being read aloud. Anyway, some of your audience may have read your paper carefully and will not thank you for having to go through all of it again. Therefore, what you must do is follow the following nine points: one, decide on a time limit for your talk. Tell the audience what it is. Stick to your time limit. This is very important. Two, write out your spoken presentation in the way that you intend to say it. This means that you must do some of the work of writing the paper again. In a sense, you may think that this is a waste of time, but it isn't. If a speaker tries to make a summary of his paper 
while he is standing in front of his audience, the results are usually disastrous. 3. Concentrate only on the main points. Ignore details. Hammer home the essence of your argument. If necessary, find ways of making your basic points so that your audience will be clear about what they are. 4. Try to make your spoken presentation lively and interesting. This doesn't necessarily mean telling jokes and anecdotes. But if you can, think of interesting or amusing examples to illustrate your argument. Use them. 5. If you are not used to speaking in public, write out everything you have to say, including example etc. Rehearse what you are going to say until you are word perfect. 6. When you know exactly what you are going to say, reduce it to outline notes. Rehearse your talk again, this time from the outline notes. Make sure you can find your way easily from the outline notes to the full notes, in case you forget something. 7. At the seminar, speak from the outline notes, but bring both sets of notes and your original paper to the meeting. Knowing that you have a full set of notes available will be good for your self-confidence. 8. Look at your audience while you are speaking. The technique to use is this. First, read the appropriate parts of your notes silently. If you are using outline notes, this won't take long. Then, look up at your audience and say what you have to say. Never speak while you are still reading. While you are looking at your audience, try to judge what they are thinking. Are they following you? You will never make contact with your audience if your eyes are fixed on the paper in front of you. 9. Make a strong ending. One good way of doing this is to repeat your main points briefly and invite questions or comments. Perhaps I can sum up by saying this. Remember that listening is very different from reading. Something that is going to be listened to has therefore got to be prepared in a different way from something that is intended to be read. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.